Thank you, Dean Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Grace Bagwell Adams. I'm in the College of Public Health and am the Assistant Dean of Outreach and Engagement and Equity there. And it has been such a gift to work in this college and to work with Dean Davis. And she um, entrusted me in this leadership role, has really prioritized um, the work that we're doing in equity, not just within the college, but across the state of Georgia. And that's how this program was born. I have long loved um, and cherished the Georgia Municipal Association and my partnerships there with Becky Taylor as a graduate student. I got introduced to that organization and have just always admired and respected the incredible work that they do across the state with local governments. And I also have a passion and a special soft spot for local government in general. So this really brought a lot of um, passions together for me personally and professionally. And uh, we have been gifted with an extraordinary group of students this first semester. We have five health equity fellows and because of a generous donation to the College of Public Health, we were able to provide each of those fellows with a stipend to help support them in their work. Um, and because of the generosity and dedication of the Georgia Municipal Association and their work in equity and inclusion, it really all came together at a perfect time, I think, for us to kind of complement what each of us are doing in the mission, vision, and values that we have in each of our organizations. So we are very grateful for that. And I just wanna say that these students um, trusted the college, I think, um, to step out into sort of the unknown, um, with us and uh, it has been a joy. We have met with them weekly. I was on maternity leave and Dean Davis very graciously stepped into that for me. And I also just wanna say that in addition to the college for providing this space and opportunity, we would not have been able to do this without the wonderful support. Each fellow had a mentor in the College of Public Health. So we wanna just thank those mentors that have served as well. Uh, Dr. Mel Garber, Dr. Bob Galen, uh, Dr. Christina Proctor, and Dr. Janani Thapa, and Do Dr. Juliet Sakandi. So each of those mentors have also served a critical role in getting us to here today to be able to present to you um, the work that's that's going on. And so I'll just give a brief overview. Um, we left the charge for each of these fellows pretty broad. We said, we want you to work with your community. We want you to work hand in hand alongside them in partnership to think about and to deliver something that will help them advance um, health equity and public health in their communities. And so for a lot of these projects that has really included some meaningful research and I think some assessment work, um, some are more specific than others, but I'm just really happy and excited for each of these students to share their output. So just to go over the, the agenda quickly, what we're gonna do, each student will have 15 minutes to present their project and then we'll facilitate a Q&A uh, session for around five minutes for each project. During that time, please feel free to either ask your question or um, by, by unmuting yourself or putting your question in the chat box and I'll be happy to read it aloud and facilitate it that way if you prefer. Uh, and then once the five minute Q&A period is up for each fellow, we'll keep moving to the next one. So that is the agenda. We'll close out with some remarks from um, Becky Taylor of the Georgia Municipal Association and, and then just thank you for coming. So again, thank you so much. I wanted to let you know we are recording just for the folks that uh, aren't able to be here today so they have an opportunity to view it and simply just because we're very proud of, of these students and want to document um, their presentations and the work. So thank you also to the city officials and to the GMA officials that have joined us and to the guests that we also have from our own college. Um, we've invited our faculty and staff as well. And several of our students have some loved ones that have been able to come. So that's always a very special thing. And I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic is having an opportunity to share um, your work with folks who might not otherwise get to see it. So I'm going to stop talking and we are now gonna move into the important part of this presentation. And um, we actually have Harrison who is going to be starting us off. And Harrison, I'm gonna screen share now. And um, I'm going to go into presentation mode. Can you all see my see the slides, Health Equity Fellowship? Great. Yep. Okay. Just go into play. All right, Harrison, you can take it away. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Adams. Um, before I start, I just wanna thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, the South Equity Fellowship has been one of the highlights of my semester um, this year, um, getting to work with a city that I would never have visited otherwise, Young Harris, um, and learning more about them has been really a blessing. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Dr. Adams. 
Sorry. And I'm so just jumping into things. I'm so sorry, Harrison. Oh, no, you're fine. I'm getting it. There we go. Okay. Okay. And so just jumping into things, just a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, so first, starting off with just an introduction to Young Harris, a little bit about the city itself, and then moving into our actual work with the city. So first, developing a substance use report, um, and then kind of segueing off of that, uh, which something I'm really excited to talk about is our youth leadership development program that we've been talking a lot about over the course of the semester, um, and that I'm really excited to see, to see blossom and come into fruition. Uh, next slide. And so Young Harris itself, um, you can see it's way up there in North Georgia, near, near the border with North Carolina. Um, it's located inside of Towns County, population of about 1,000 people, uh, median household income about 38,000 and 96% white. Um, so a relatively rural community um, up there and, and a relatively small one. Um, and in addition to that, what we see as one of the kind of major attractions there is Young Harris College, kind of a small private liberal arts college. Uh, and that houses about 15,000 students in its overall enrollment. Uh, next slide. And so first I wanna talk about some of our work. So this first project that we did is a substance use report. Um, and so the goal of this is really to distill down the many, many reports and documents that Mayor Gibby gets um, about substance use in the area where she, where I literally went through probably over 500 pages of reports. Um, and frankly, that's not feasible for her to, to really wrap her mind around and really to get through, considering that she's not only mayor, but also has another full-time job in her back pocket. Um, and so hopefully I was just trying to make her life a little, a little bit easier by understanding what, how exactly substance use plays into the role um, within Young Harris. So next slide. And so first off, I wanna talk about kind of why exactly are we doing this and what are the public health implications? So in Appalachian counties, the opioid overdose death rate is 72% higher than that of non-Appalachian counties. And the opioid prescription rates are up to 50% higher. And so there we already see a significantly increased burden of disease um, in Appalachian counties where young Harris would be uh, compared to non-Appalachian counties in the rest of the country. And in addition to that, within Towns County itself, a community health needs assessment was conducted in 2018. Um, and in just about every single question, when you go through it and you read through all the questions and all the surveys, constantly you see pop up over and over again, substance use um, is just one of the most overwhelming public health issues that, that their, their citizens are concerned about. Um, in addition to that, like we talked about, the specific data for Towns County and for Young Harris, although it exists, it's very scattered around um, and it's not necessarily something that's very accessible. It's something that takes a little bit of diving to get into and to understand fully. Um, and so our goal here was really to distill it down into a brief, you know, 15 page or so report uh, to give to the mayor so that we can create actionable steps and items moving forward. Next slide. And so jumping into our findings a little bit, um, obviously there are quite a few things that we could talk about, but for the sake of this presentation, I wanted to pick out a few slides um, that really highlight some of the issues at hand. And so what you'll see here, just to orient yourself, is rankings um, of these different categories and where Towns Counties falls relative to the 159 counties that we have here in Georgia. So high school binge alcohol use, 154th, high school methamphetamine use, 154th, high school heroin use, 156th, and then overall any opioid related deaths, 145th. And so we see here, again, a significant burden of disease in Towns County. So we know that it's really localized and it's really severe and significant both at an overall level, but also more concerningly at a youth level, right? At these high school rankings are a major worrying point. And as we'll see later, um, hopefully what we see is that as we continue our, our youth leadership development, some of these rankings will, will be able to go down and we'll see Towns County rise up. Uh, so next slide. And so talking about kind of what exactly do we do about specifically opioid use um, generally is, First off, talking about medication assisted treatment. This is the use of medication in addition to uh, different different therapies and counseling and behavioral health programs to treat substance use disorder. Um, and so those are the three medications that are currently FDA approved to treat opioid use. I don't know how to pronounce them. I'm not gonna try, um, but there they are. And so the value of this is that it's a very long-term program, but it's also something that has been shown to be very effective. The problem though, is that it's so hard to get to and, and there's little access as we'll see later in these slides. Um, so this is a long-term program through Matt. And second of all, 
uh, we see naloxone or Narcan as a brand name is called. Um, and this is an emergency medication used to rapidly treat opioid overdoses. This is something that, that's typically done out in the field where if you see somebody overdosing, if, if you administer Narcan, it can often literally save a life within minutes. And this is something that any community member should and could be trained on. Uh, you're protected by medical amnesty in the state of Georgia. It's not a concern. I could literally train everybody on this call in like 15 minutes, it's super easy. And it's super important to have in communities. Next slide. And so talking about that Narcan, some good news that we have though is Narcan training and access it has been provided to first responders in Towns County on March 30th of this year. Um, so just about a month ago, we see that access and that road starting to be paved. And so now it's time to kind of expand on that in the coming months and years. So hopefully that Narcan access can be provided more readily and more availably. Next slide. Now that said, turning our attention over to MAT, there are no MAT treatment programs in Towns County. And in addition to that, um, you'll see on the slide after this that there's little accessibility in these neighboring counties. Um, and so as we have few clinics in a large area, that those few clinics are serving everybody. And so it's, it's not just Towns County that we're worried about, but all of North Georgia, rural Georgia and Appalachia, it's something that's very concerning in all of these areas. And in addition to that, one of the major points is that very frequent visits are required. In some clinics, you literally have to go there to, to get your medication every single day for the first 90 days. Um, and when you're thinking about traveling up to an hour or two hours, uh, either way, that's something that's frankly not feasible for anybody with a job, with a life, with kids, with anything going on. Um, you can't just dedicate your life to, to getting this mat each and every day. And now not, not every clinic is about every day. It requires everyday visits. Um, and some of the guidelines have been changing with COVID, but regardless, what you're going to see is very frequent visits are still going to be required no matter what, because that's what's essential in order to keep your patients and your clients accountable within these treatments and to ensure that they actually work. Uh, next slide. And so to orient yourself on this slide, this is a, a slide of all the different, uh, or, or of the three closest MAT clinics to Young Harris. And so up there at the top, you'll see Young Harris itself, um, and then three arrows to each of those clinics. Um, and so although there is one 15 minutes away, and that sounds like good news, the fact of the matter is that that clinic is not just serving Young Harris, it's serving this entire area. So this entire map encompasses most of North Georgia. Um, and it's, the, all of these clinics are so scattered about and they're so sparse that the access to it is just unavailable and it's really hard to get to. And not just that, but that one clinic that's 15 minutes away, if you do a quick Google search of them, you'll see multiple citations of that clinic where they don't have enough, enough providers, where every single provider has over 50 clients. And that's something that, that that's illegal by SAMHSA guidelines. Um, and so we see not only lack of access for clients, but also a lack of providers to even get that access to, to those clients. So the, all these clinics are constantly overbooked, overworked, and it's really hard to, to fulfill that need within these rural communities. Next slide. And so turning our attention over to some of our recommendations then, um, I wanna talk about three points. There are obviously many other things that we could do, but for the sake of this short presentation, I wanna talk first about inclusion of faith-based leadership. We are in Towns County, we're in rural Georgia, we're in the Bible Belt, a lot of churches in the area and a lot of influence of these churches. Second, talking about increasing accessibility to care. As you kind of go through uh, just about any PowerPoint, any presentation about substance use, you're gonna see this slide pop up. This is not a rural specific issue. This is not a Towns County specific issue. This is an issue everywhere in the US and in the world. And lastly, something I'm really excited to talk about is early intervention and prevention through youth development. Our youth leadership development program that we've been talking about has been something that I'm really excited to see grow in, in the coming months. Next slide. So first of all, faith-based leadership, you know, there are many churches in the area and these churches are super important to the community members. Um, they hold a lot of influence. They're leaders, especially in terms of people who can provide guidance to the community, people who can provide uh, community and congregation um, to everybody in the area. And so part of the issue then is that historically we see a lot of uh, removal of and, and lack of understanding of substance use within churches, within faith-based programs. Um, and so it's important that as we engage in dialogues and conversations with many of the leaders and the pastors in the area, that we teach them and educate them about what exactly substance use is, how to deal with it, and how to remove its stigma so it's okay to talk about and not just completely ignore it and sweep under the rug. And so these churches will play a key role, not just there, but also across the spectrum when it comes to substance use disorder, across 
across prevention, treatment, and recovery in terms of facilitating conversation and healing um, across all of those fields. Next slide. And so secondly, access accessibility to care, MAT and naloxone access, we already talked about all of those. The, the, these are two points that are absolutely critical um, in terms of creating an emergency response to substance use to, into opioid overdoses, as well as a long-term preventative, uh, or rather recovery method through MAT. Um, and secondly, uh, what we've seen over the course of this pandemic is that a lot of behavioral health providers is, are willing to engage in telehealth. Um, and so when you're coming to rural Georgia, Obviously, it's hard to build facilities constantly everywhere within every single city in the area. And so telehealth becomes a key part of, of how we can provide uh, longitudinal care to clients um, in a way that's accessible for them rather than having them travel out hour, two hours out um, every single day. And thirdly, just overall investment in behavioral health programs is something that I could recommend to every single community, Athens included, um, where as we increase these, we're going to see the overall health of the community and overall well-being increase. Next slide. And so moving into our youth leadership development program, this is something that we've been talking about all semester long as we kind of worked our way through some of the public health concerns within Young Harris, something that we kept harping on, something that we kept getting to is the fact that if we want to make sustainable long-term change, it's going to start with the kids. It's going to start with the students in the area. Um, and so this was our goal in terms of working with that. And so talking about public health as it relates to this, public health is interdisciplinary. Everything touches public health from infrastructure to environment, to politics, to workforce development and civic action. Um, everything does. And so our goal is to promote positive and so positive social and cultural norms, as well as to fill some gaps in service where um, a 2018 community health needs assessment actually found that outside of employment concerns, positive youth activities was actually the, the area of service that needed the most improvement. And so this is our goal in trying to fill that gap a little bit. Next slide. And so this implementation of this program wouldn't be possible without numerous partnerships. Um, and so first, I want to give a quick shout out to the JW Fanning Institute for Leadership Development. This is a, um, an institute at UGA that has done tremendous work across all of Georgia and across many different communities, implementing different youth, diff youth leadership development programs in many different cities. Um, and so using their model and using their expertise to help guide us while also customizing it for the sake of Towns County and for Young Harris has been absolutely critical. And in addition to them, Towns County Civic, Civic Association, Joint Development Authority and Young Harris College have also been key partners in this program. And so what we see is a lot of uh, engagement and passion within the community. Um, it's just having us funnel that into a cohesive and actionable step in terms of de developing this program. Next slide. And so our target then is actually going to be late elementary school students. We're thinking right now maybe fourth or fifth grade because what we see a lot of times is around sixth grade, you start to see that fall off. We start to see that delineation between students who are going to make it and students who are going to start to struggle a little bit and fall into things that we don't necessarily want them to fall into. And so catching them before that happens and preventing that fall is going to be absolutely critical. And the actual curriculum of the program, obviously, is going to encompass a lot more things, but these are just three key points. Um, understanding leadership, how it comes about, what it means, how to lead your peers, um, and in addition to that, promoting positive social and cultural norms. This is really going to come into play with the substance use, where hopefully we can uh, take action before any concern is there, right? We saw those high, those high school level rankings of the, of the counties in Georgia, and so this is getting there before we get to that point um, to teach them about drug use, about substance use and how to avoid it. And lastly, looking beyond Young Harris, understanding that Young Harris is just one town and one city in, in a big wide world um, and that there is a lot of life to be lived potentially outside of it. Um, in contrast, a lot of what we see historically is, is that Young Harris is where you are, it's where you're always gonna be. And that's not necessarily the mentality that we wanna promote. Um, instead, promoting a po really positive community that, that advocates for a lot of exploration and widening of perspectives. Um, and so as we kind of wrap up here, I really wanna point out the fact that you've seen a lot of really negative slides, especially with the substance use stuff. Um, but what we also see is a lot of passion and engagement within these communities and a lot of partnerships from the Civic Association to the college to everybody else in the city where there's a lot of action to be made and a lot of um, people who want to do that action. Um, and so this is something that I've seen over our conversations in, in, in the semester with Mayor Gibby and with the rest of the team at Young Harris, um, where they're just people who legitimately, legitimately want to see their community improve. And it's something that I'm really excited to see as well. Uh, next slide. And so lastly, none of this would have been possible without a lot of different people to help me along the way. Uh, first of all, Dr. Mel Garber, uh, my mentor for this program. 
Um, you have been with me every step of the way, uh, entertaining me with your constant stories and everything that you do. You, literally working with cities like this has been your job for however many decades now. Um, and on the Young Harris end of things, Mayor Gibby, Amy Rosser, Denise McKay, Dr. War, Dr. Laura Whitaker Lee have all have all been key in, in contributing to our conversations um, and helping me learn more about the city itself. And then on the fanning side of things, I only wrote Lauren Healy on here because obviously not enough space, uh, but also uh, Matt and Maritza have been absolutely critical. And on the College of Public Health and Dean Marsha Davis, Dr. Adams and Shelley Bargett, none of this would have been possible. None of this would have even happened without all of your support and guidance. So that's all I got for y'all today. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with me um, and I'll open it up to any questions now. All right, thank you so much, Harrison. Uh, I'm going to monitor the chat, and um, if you want to ask a question via chat or just go ahead and ask him by unmuting yourself, that's fine. We've got about five minutes for questions. I don't have a question. I do want to say thank you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Andrea Gibby, and um, I, I don't know about the rest of the cities, but you gave me the best one. I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> I've, thoroughly, I've, had, I've thoroughly enjoyed our time with him. Um, Harrison is, he is one of the best facilitators I've ever seen. And I told him this the last time we were on. I mean, he's better than most of the adults that have been trained to facilitate. And that's going to that's gonna carry him a long way in his life. And he's been able just to bring a, a world of, um, you know, bring our, our world of knowledge together to help us, you know, formulate where we're going to go next. So thank you, Harrison. I really, I really have enjoyed you this time. Thank you so much, Mary. That, that honestly means the world to me. Thank you so much, Mayor Gibby. Um, I've got one question here. Do broadband limitations impact effective telehealth? Yeah, so absolutely. And I, I think Dr. Adams might be more equipped to answer this than me, but um, that, that absolutely is a concern. But at the same time, telehealth isn't necessarily just video chatting like you might think about. Telehealth en encompasses a lot more um, when it comes to different things like the different texting apps um, to be able to communicate. Phone calls count as telehealth. Um, and so the, the ability to kind of work around some of those limitations and be creative with it and flexible with it are, are going to be key points moving forward. That's right. Harrison um, is modest, so he won't tell you, but he also worked this semester to help me wrap up a behavioral health needs assessment in athens Clark County and five contiguous counties. And uh, Stan, this is one of the things that we really dug into with that needs assessment is asking our behavioral health providers about telehealth. And if, again, you know, I really keep trying to look for the silver linings with COVID. And one of the things we're observing is a lot of behavioral health providers in our region, 75% actually, who before did not offer telehealth services are now offering them for the first time. And one of the things that we're seeing is that those organizations are being very flexible because we actually have a lot of rural counties that are served here in our health services area as well. Um, so to Harrison's point, yes, yeah, sometimes it is video chatting and it is good to have that high speed internet, but it doesn't, you don't have to have it in order to explore telehealth options. Um, so I think, you know, in a best case, best world scenario, you've got this excellent broadband connection, but we know that's not the reality in a lot of our counties and a lot of our cities. And so um, just encouraging your providers, your health services providers um, to be flexible and to think a little bit more broadly about telehealth, I think is, is a good way to go. If, if I could say something, I'm Denise McKay, I'm Economic Development Director in Towns County. Because of Harrison's work, um, we have, he's been the catalyst to get us moving towards our youth development program. We had meetings this week with the Joint Development Authority and the Rotary International that has a club here and they have both agreed, um, giving me letters of support. We are applying for the Fanning Institute um, Innovation Community uh, to request help with developing youth development leadership program for our area. And we have already got partners on board with us. So thank you, Harrison. You have been the catalyst to get this going forward. We greatly appreciate it. It was in our longer term plans to develop it, but it has come to the forefront and hopefully within a year, we will have a full blown program for our community. You've made this possible, thank you. That's incredible. And if, if we're just gonna spend these five minutes complimenting me, I guess I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ms. McKay and uh, Mayor Gibby, we just are so grateful that you shared this with us. And I, I think the deepest hope that we've had about this program is that it would not just provide our students in our cities with an opportunity to connect, but that it would 
be just that. And it's okay. It's a catalyst for action. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think Harrison, I'm going to let you off the hook easy and go ahead and wrap up your Q and A at that point. <laughs> and we're going to keep moving. We um, are now going to move to the city of Milledgeville, Georgia and sharing with you um, their project uh, in Milledgeville is going to be Carlincia McDowell. So Carlincia, um, just a second, let me get my slides pulled up and then we will get going. Okay, can y'all see these? And I just want to give a quick disclaimer. Um, my connection has been a little iffy throughout this presentation, so I will have my camera off while I'm presenting, but I'll come back on for questions and everything afterwards. So that's perfect, Carlincia. Don't worry. You go right ahead. All right. So good afternoon. I am Carlincia McDowell, a spring 2021 Health Equity Fellow, and I will be presenting to you today on the importance of health equity within rural Georgia. And my focus is, will be on the historic city of Milledgeville. So within today, we will get, have a good overview of Milledgeville, how the Central State Hospital is important to the community, project goals that we had throughout this fellowship, county comparisons, two sources that we utilize, observations that we had, our following steps, and definitely acknowledgments. Next slide, please. So Milledgeville is also known as the First Lady of Georgia and was once the capital a little over 60 years in Georgia. As you can see on the map at the top of the screen, Milledgeville is located in the middle of Georgia in Baldwin County. On the bottom, you can see that the city is diverse with 53.2% being non-Hispanic whites, 42.84% being non-Hispanic black, 2.32% being Hispanic and 1.73% being Asian. The population estimate is a little over 40 4,000 with a median household income of 42,700 and there's believed about 41.2 percent of persons below the poverty level in the community. Next slide. So within this fellowship, our mission is to observe health inequity within our cities and with the assistance of the city manager, understand what the community needs. Health equity ensures that everybody in the community has knowledge, skill set, and resources to achieve optimal health. There is a need for mental health knowledge and services in Milledgeville, which is marginally due to the Central State Hospital closing. Central State Hospital is a prominent landmark in Milledgeville and was built in 1842. The Jones Building served as a general hospital, offering medical care to patients at Central State, as well as residents of Milledgeville and the surrounding area. Due to the hospital closing a little more than five years ago, those in Millersville who need care lacked effective services and some end up homeless. In turn, when those with serious mental illnesses are in distress, the police are called. Next slide, please. So Mr. Hank, the city manager of Millersville, wanted to understand a baseline of the community health what the city can do to have a large population of individuals getting incarcerated due to mental health issues, and also what methods can be used to help them not be incarcerated. With this in mind, we looked to see where Baldwin County stood health-wise and compared it to other counties in Georgia. So far with my mentor, Dr. Thapa's assistance, I developed four comparison data sets that will be grouped into one and three reports about the current state of Baldwin County. Our goal is that the end product will remove mental health barriers in the area and in turn decrease the rate of those with serious mental illnesses getting incarcerated. Next slide, please. So right here, I would like to show you how we picked the total of 14 different counties that we compared Milledgeville to. So on the left in the graph, you will see where Milledgeville stands. And I initially looked into the surrounding counties to see how they compared, but then I was let known that the resources, the population size, and the racial demographics was not quite comparable as we had hoped. So then we looked into counties within Georgia who have similar population. So that led us to Coffey, Thomas, Habersham, and Colquitt. And then Mr. Hank had his interest in McDuffie and Spalding because he has done previous work with them, and then Towns County because they are also a college town. Next slide, please. So the first source that we looked into was the county health rankings, which provided us a snapshot of the reserved community's health and a starting point of where change can manifest within the community. 
So the data collected from the source that I reported were the demographics, the social and economic factors, the health outcome, health factors and behaviors, clinical care and services, and residential segregation. To the right, you will see the model that is used within the rankings, and it shows how the categories are grouped. Next slide, please. And so presented here are some of the health outcome rankings. And it's important to know that these are out of 159 counties. So we have the health outcomes, we have length of life and the quality of health. Overall, these underscore the importance of the physical, mental, social and emotional well-being of individuals from birth to adulthood. And we can see that Milledgeville falls in the middle. So there is room for improvement and we can look at the counties above to see what they are doing and see if that can be applicable to Baldwin. So here are some key findings that we have is that one in four individuals are 25% reporting having poor or fair health. One in seven individuals are 14% reported having frequent physical and mental distress. And lastly, one in four reported that they had physical, that they were physically inactive. This statistic is important to observe because it shows how mental and physical health closely relate to each other. Next slide. This graph right here is displaying the number of individuals less than 65 years old who reported being uninsured. It can be seen that 16% or for every six people, one person reported being uninsured. If you look further, this is similar within the McDuffie, Spalding and Thomas counties. If you look at the rankings to the right, Baldwin County came in third pertaining to clinical care and services. This means that the services that towns and Haversham provides their community may be beneficial to look into for Baldwin. Next slide. So the second source that we looked into was the Georgia Student Health Survey, which was an annual anonymous self-reported survey and conducted by the Georgia Department of Education. To the left are the categories that I collected within this data set. So that was demographics, peer and adult support, school safety, suicide, and mental health. The purpose of looking into this data is to provide a baseline of mental health conditions for younger individuals as recent mental health initiatives in the community have targeted Milledgeville's youth. So overall within this source, we saw that Milledgeville fared better than Spalding County and McDuffie on most questions within the survey. Therefore, it did not provide as much information as initially hoped, but there were some statistics within it that was very interesting to review. So we saw like right here that one in four individuals, well, one in four students had felt unsafe at school or on their way to or from school. Additionally, one in four students are 25% have some concern about their physical safety while at school. And lastly, two out of five students reported not being treated fairly by their adults in school. Next slide. When observing mental health, we saw that one in seven reported being depressed, sad, or withdrawn for one or two days out of the month. One in 25 students reported experiencing intense anxiety, worries, or fears all 30 days. And overall, one in five students reported feeling some type of mental distress. Next slide, please. It can be observed based on the health counting rankings that physical and mental health are closely related in Baldwin County and increased community access to mental health services is needed. We saw that 36% of Baldwin County do not have access to exercise opportunity and 14% of adults reported experiencing poor mental and physical days more than half a month. It is hoped that putting focus towards the community getting physically active will also increase their mental health. Within the county rank, it displayed a need for health professionals overall in the community, as there is one primary care physician to every 1,800 residents, one mental health provider to 720 residents, and one primary care provider to 1,093 residents. Next slide, please. And based on the Georgia Student Health Survey, it's imperative to ensure that the mental health services to the students are culturally competent. So this means that they are fit to everybody, no matter where they come from or their racial background. As it is seen that 78.4% of the students in the Baldwin High School, which is the only high school in Baldwin County, are a part of a minority group. Also, we believe it is important to look into the adult social support inside the school, outside of mental health professionals, as they can play an important role in adolescent development and mental health well-being to the point where adolescents do not feel like they can only go to their peers for information or to know what to do. 
Overall, we should also evaluate the current existing school-based mental health initiatives and see where improvements can be made. As 36.2 overall felt depressed, sad, and withdrawn at some point throughout the month, and 20% of students had intense anxieties, worries, and fears that got in the way of their daily activities. Next slide, please. Therefore, this indicates that an immediate next step would be to do further research within the Georgia Student Health Survey and utilize all of the counties that was initially observed in the county health rankings report. So these include Habersham, Towns, Thomas, Coffee, and Colquitt County. Short term, in about three to six months from now, the updated measures would be examined and determined if there are best practices that can be duplicated in Millersville, especially those that are related to dealing with mental health as a deciding factor on crimes committed or for those who are currently in incarceration. Long term, the goal is to implement police initiatives that focus on mental health and diversion programs for those with serious mental illnesses or are in care of need. An example of the initiative that we have observed is the Stepping Up Initiative, which is a national campaign that focuses on diverting individuals with mental illnesses from jail into treatment facilities. Next slide, please. Ultimately, a need for mental health services has been recognized within the Millersfield area, and the goal of this project is to eliminate barriers in order to improve the community's health, as well as aiming to decrease the number of individuals getting incarcerated with serious mental health illnesses. It is imperative that we have the right services and provide the community with effective tools to support their health and well-being. Although I have not been to Millersville, through Mr. Hank's vantage point, I have gasped on my new understanding of the diverse community and have analyzed methods to hopefully improve their health equity. And through this, we aim to compare, observe, and gain information on initiatives that can best fit Millersville. Next slide. Overall, I am completely grateful to have been a part of an inaugural cohort of this fellowship, as you all have truly allowed me to immerse myself in the public health field and focus on two topics I am passionate about, health equity and mental health. I would like to send a huge thank you to Ms. Becky Taylor and the Georgia Municipal Association as a whole, Mr. Hank Griffith, Dr. Thapa, Dean Davis, Dr. Bagwell, and Michelle for honestly just trusting me to serve the Millersville community and all that you have personally done to make this experience a remarkable one. This has been a busy but a very, very exciting semester. And I also want to thank you to my family and my friends that joined this meeting today. And next slide. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Carlencia. So proud of you. Um, can we now get some questions for Carlencia or comments? Well, Carlencia and Janani both will tell you I, I'm never going to be at a loss for words. Uh, so I, I want to, to uh, first off say thank you to Carlencia for the hard work that she did. Um, she and uh, Janani got on a Zoom meeting with me um, I guess probably six weeks or so ago, and they let me ramble. Uh, and by the time I got finished rambling, uh, we had a research project uh, that Carlencia was going to start on. And uh, I appreciate so much the hard work that she's done. She's got some more work to do for us, uh, and she's going to do that. She's going to get the rest of those data elements together. We're going to have her come do her presentation to city council on May 11th. Uh, so they can see the data that she has um, she has uh, uncovered, and we're going to take that and start looking at some best practices in some of those communities uh, to see if they're doing some things that uh, we need to be doing. One of the things I've already learned is that two of the communities that I thought were doing things pretty well, we're actually doing them better than they are. Um, so that's oftentimes a good measure to uh, to meet uh, as well. But uh, I also want to say thank you to. Uh, you, Grace, uh, after a GMA call, uh, five minutes after GMA call, I was shooting an email to you and you responded back in between you and Becky. Um, you all got us to be a part of this inaugural uh, fellowship program. And uh, I and the city of Milledgeville appreciate it uh, so much and I look forward to, to continuing this data review and, uh, and then seeing what's out there that we can uh, either create on our own or um, uh, put in Milledgeville that other cities are, are being successful with. So thank you all for letting us be a part of this. 
Absolutely. Thank you for trusting us. Yeah, you're at Millichill's the first city I heard from that was interested. Um, so you were <laughs> for top of my list when we started pairing and talking with GMA. So thank you so much for trusting us. Anybody else have any questions or comments for Carlincy? I think we've got time for one more. Okay, well, with that, I think we're going to keep moving now. Um, and let's see, I'm going to go ahead and screen share again with you all. <clears throat> Move us into the next presentation. Next, we have Jenny Casada with us, and she was in Moultrie, Georgia. Jenny, you can take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. My community was Moultrie, Georgia, and this is my presentation, Providing Connect to resources for the public's health in Moultrie, Georgia. Next slide, please. All right, so this is an agenda for my presentation. Um, I'll begin with a background on Moultrie, and then I will explain the health issue that was identified, and then I'll go into what I did to address it, um, how it addresses a health issue, and followed by next steps. All right, next slide, please. All right, so here's some background information on Moultrie. Um, there's approximately 14,000 people living in the city and there's around 5,600 households. So 3,500 families residing in the city. Um, it's a kind of diverse area. There's 38.5% of the population is white, 50.2% is African-American and 4.72% identify as other races. 10% um, of the population identifies as Hispanic or Latino. And of the 5,663 households, one in three households have children under the age of 18 living with them. So there's quite a few kids. Um, the median income for a household was 36,193. And the median income for a family was around $43,000. And then just for reference, I, um, put in that the poverty guideline for a family of four is 25,750. So the city is not doing too bad, thankfully. All right, next slide. And um, here's some information about day-to-day -day life in Moultrie. I got this from the Moultrie website and I don't know how accurate it still is due to COVID restrictions, but um, downtown Moultrie still has 30, over 30, uh, specialty shops and restaurants where you can stroll, shop and dine. The third weekend in April, there's this event known as the Spring Fling and Backyard Barbecue Festival. This event has arts and crafts, live entertainment, children's activities, a barbecue competition and much more. And then additionally, the second Saturday of every month, uh, store owners will stay open late and those above the age of 21 can get an event armband and a cup from participating restaurants. And that armband and cup will allow people to sip wine and beer. And then at 7.30 till 9.30, uh, there's live music. So a band takes the stage and performs. And then um, the end, there's the link for the website that I got the information from. And there's so many other events too. All right. And then here's the health issue that was identified. So after our first Zoom call uh, between city manager, Pete Dillard, my mentor, Dr. Galen and myself, we found that one of the biggest issues in the community is people being unaware of the resources available to them. And we reached this conclusion because Mr. Dillard had mentioned that people use the emergency room as a clinic. Uh, two potential reasons that we came up for this was it's all someone knows. So they might not know about smaller urgent care clinics that they can go to to handle their not so serious you know, medical emergencies or financial reasons. So maybe they do know about these clinics but they're scared that they'll be turned away because they can't afford them or they don't have insurance. Whereas emergency rooms legally cannot turn people away because of EMT ALA laws. Uh, next slide. And the reason why this is such a big problem, uh, two main reasons that I found was one, occupying beds at the ER for minor reasons prevents people who need the ER from getting immediate care. And also it hurts the hospital in terms of funding. So periods of high ER crowding are associated with an increased inpatient mortality, as well as increased lengths of stay and costs for admitted patients. And also the overuse of American emergency departments is responsible for $38 billion in wasteful spending. And then on the left, that's an infographic from Florida Blue. And uh, one of the things that the infographic says, I don't know if you can see it, but it says 71% of emergency department visits are unnecessary or could have been avoided. 
Uh, next slide, please. And so what I did to address it was I built a health resources directory. Um, so in case anyone isn't aware, a directory is a book that lists individuals or organizations alphabetically or thematically with details such as names, addresses, and phone number. So the directory that I made separates resources by categories, and then it gives specific listings that include the name, the phone number, their address, uh, the website, if applicable, the services provided, whether or not they take Medicaid or Medicare and their hours operation. So uh, this directory will allow people to find resources that fit their needs. And it also helps people gain information about places without having to look too hard for it themselves. And the target audience for this directory is the people of Moultrie, specifically the ones that will overuse the ER or don't have the best health literacy skills. And then on the right is a cover page. Okay, next slide. Um, the methods for building the directory are as follows. So first I found a previous directory from 2018. Um, then I went through each listing and checked to see if the information was still current, if it was still accurate. Um, additionally, I checked each listing to see what services they provided, whether or not they took Medicare or Medicaid, and what their hours were. And then I did my own research to find new resources to replace the old ones that were outdated that I had to get rid of. Uh, the screenshot above is the Excel sheet that I made. Um, there's two Excel sheets, one in English, one in Spanish, because I did translate it. I'll go into that later. But um, if you can see on the, from the screenshot, it's organized by columns. So the far left, has resource category, and then there's a listing, the services that the listing provides, their address, their website, their phone number, whether they take Medicare, whether they take Medicaid, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, so as I previously mentioned, I translated all the content from the directory into Spanish. Um, if you remember on the first slide, I mentioned that Moultrie has a 10% Hispanic or Latina population. So by translating the directory into Spanish, I'm making it more accessible to everyone. So no matter, well, I guess not everyone, but more people. Um, and then on the right, there's a cover page for the Spanish directory. Uh, next slide. And here's what it accomplished. So the directory addresses the inequity because it provides a way for those without computer or internet access, without the best English skills, or with health literacy problems to get information about their health resources. And then again, there's a the cover pages. Um, next. So here are next steps. Uh, now that we have a directory, it's important to spread the information. So we print more copies, we distribute them across the community. Um, if possible, we put the directory on a website for those that do have internet access. And most importantly, we keep this as a base and we add more onto it in the future. Uh, next. Here's a dissemination plan that I've come up with. The first step is engaging the faith community. So we can have the directory available at churches or other places of worship. Um, it'll reach a lot of people that way. Uh, the second step is having the directories at public restaurants and bars. That way it's accessible to those who may not attend church and it still reaches a large amount of people that way. Uh, the third is working with stakeholders. So we can contact local Moultrie politicians or just those involved in the community, have them pass up the directory. And as previously mentioned, have an online version so we can find a website to serve as our host, whether that be the City of Moultrie website, the YMCH, anyone that's willing to have it on their website to reach more people. But the end goal is to have as many people as possible in Moultrie know about it. Uh, next slide, please. And as far as routine updates, because this is supposed to be a current document, it needs to be kept relevant. Um, a bit of information from the former document was outdated or incorrect. Because it was from 2018, there were a few numbers that no longer worked or the resource listing was under the wrong category. But the more the directory lives online, the more can be updated. So my recommendation is every few months or so, the information should be revisited just to ensure that the phone numbers are the same, the addresses hasn't changed, stuff like that. Right, next. And um, here's my acknowledgements. Of course, I'd like to thank Dean Davis, Dr. Adams, Dr. Galen, my mentor, the best mentor, um, Shelly for hosting all the meetings, city manager Pete Dillard for allowing me to do this and other members of the cohort um, for your support, making me feel welcome. Thank you all. And my final slide, questions. Thank you so much, Jenny. All right, so any, uh -oh. all 
All right, any questions or comments for Jenny? I, I have a comment. Uh, did I unmute okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, many in, in the group here probably take for granted knowledge of where health care is available. Most of us grew up with privilege, whatever type of privilege you want to know that we knew somebody to call or where to call or where to go. But it's amazing in a town this small, and, and I, I grew up in Milledgeville and I saw the same thing there, that uh, a significant number of the portion of the population has no idea where the hospital is, where the different services are, and particularly the clinics or counseling. And to have a directory in one place that we can now link to our city website, we can disseminate to uh, many places. Um, it, it, it's, it's invaluable because there's so many that don't have access. And th this, is, this is really a valuable piece and I think it'll be well used. And we will definitely take uh, what Jenny's done and reprint, have it available, hand it out and also link it to our website and the hospital's website. Thank you. Great, thank you. That's really good to hear, thank you. Thank you so much. And I also wanna just highlight again, what Jenny's done is provided it both in English and Spanish. And I think that that is also really important, the accessibility piece. So thank you, Jenny. Any other questions or thoughts for Jenny? Hey, uh, Grace, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, does Pete think that they'll be able to keep this updated once it's uh, distributed? Will there be a, a follow up on this? Uh, yes, I, I think now that we have a document and also an understanding of the lack of information in the community, you know, most of us, well, not most of us, a lot of you look very young. Uh, Many of us grew up with a local phone book with yellow pages that had everything listed. Those don't exist anymore. And everybody is not computer savvy. So, so this will be a very valuable document. And yeah, we, we will, uh, in, in coordination with the hospital, we will keep this updated uh, probably annually. And, and, and once you have a base, once you have a foundation, an annual update will not be such a challenge, but to start from zero, which is, even though Jenny found one from 2018, that's just about starting from zero. And it, it, it'll be much better if we stay up to date with it annually. So yes. Yeah. Great job. Thank y'all so much. All right, we're gonna move now to Amber Bullard, who is actually going to uh, be presenting on Amber, you can go ahead and tell them who your city is. Introduce yourself while I was still sharing my screen. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Bullard. I am a um, graduating senior here at the University of Georgia, and I will be presenting on the beautiful city of College Park. All righty. All right, perfect. So um, our agenda for today, um, we're first gonna go over the impacts of aircraft noise annoyance um, on the city of College Park, go over some research efforts that have been um, done by myself as well as the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend the um, FAA webinar this past February, and I was able to um, submit my own comments um, to their submission online. And then I was able to interview with uh, College Park's wonderful mayor, Mayor Motley Broom, and interview with College Park's um, Councilman Ambrose Clay, who has done very extensive research um, in aircraft noise annoyance. Awesome. So my goal of um, this whole semester was to really um, combine my own research efforts with previous research that has been done um, to basically create recommendations for the future and how to address the issue of noise within the city. Um, so I was able to combine some research efforts and um, those that come after me will be able to implement those. 
So I took some existing data from the FAA, as we'll go through later on in the presentation. Um, I interviewed some city officials. I analyzed all that data, and then I came up with those recommendations. Alrighty, so first, um, what is noise annoyance? As we go throughout this presentation today, there will be um, some terms that may not be familiar with you. Um, as I've done a ton of research over the entire semester, I've become more familiar with these terms. So I do just want to start out with go ahead and um, defining one of those terms being noise annoyance, as you can see here. Um, and that's anything that interferes with speech, sleep, um, the desire for a tranquil environment, the ability to use your telephone, radio, or television satisfactorily. Alrighty, so the issue of airport noise affecting the city of College Park. So Hartsville-Jackson Atlanta International Airport, um, located in the city of College Park, has a lot of noise due to the flight paths of planes taking off and landing um, in the airport. And so this issue does not have a simple fix. Um, and that's due to two factors. One being that the airport actually brings in a lot of money to the city. Um, it's a huge employer employing more or less of 65,000 employees. And the College Park city officials also have the duty to serve their constituents as well as abiding by government agencies and regulations. So combining those two factors along with um, actually having citizens who suffer from airport noise um, can make this very complex issue that doesn't have one simple solution. Alrighty, so let's look into how people are actually impacted, impacted starting with children. Um, so children are impacted with their health. Um, it has been um, studied through the FAA and Boston University that children are actually impacted with their speech, reading comprehension, and learning motivation. Um, now, the FAA has actually tried to invest over $440 million um, for sound insulation in the schools. So that is something that is currently being done and trying to help mitigate the situation. Um, also, sleep disturbance in adults, cardiovascular disease, and economics. Um, so there's also been a study with um, the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine looking into how aircraft noise is affecting the onset of cardiovascular disease and um, how sleep disturbance is affecting people. So people are reporting less restful sleep, um, not getting enough sleep, and trouble with falling asleep. As far as economics go, um, the FAA has looked into how businesses that are actually um, underneath flight paths of airplanes are affected um, due to the traffic of um, airplanes taking off and landing. So they wanna see our businesses booming because there's a lot of um, people in the area or if a lot of people are avoiding the area due to noise. Alrighty, so the Federal Aviation Administration, as I've been saying before, um, this is an organization that regulates um, aircraft traffic and aircraft transportation. Um, they are very regulatory when it comes to airports and aircrafts. And so they focus on primarily um, actually giving out guidelines for structures and buildings that want to be built near the airport. And so this involves making sure that the height and the structure of buildings are compatible to being next to the airport. So things like solar panels are prohibited from being in buildings that are in a certain range of the airport, as well as water features. Um, water features are known to attract wildlife, especially birds. And that could be a big issue because birds are easily sucked into the engine of airplanes. Um, and that is definitely not good when you have flights coming in and out of the city. Um, and solar panels actually create a glare that can be distracting um, for the pilot with taking off and landing. You also have these avigation easements. Um, that is actually um, a deal between private property owners who accept funding on behalf of dealing with the noise that is due um, because of aircraft taking off and leaving in the area. All right, so the FAA has actually sponsored a lot of research efforts, um, one being the National or Neighborhood Environmental Survey. 
the noise exposure map that is specific to the Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. Um, they also have done some things with noise metrics and reduction abatement and mitigation programs sponsored by the airport that has spent over $65 million in trying to mitigate noise in the past. All right, so the National Environmental Survey is basically a survey that was um, conducted to update the current dose response curve. The current dose response curve was the Schultz curve. Um, and so this survey was basically aimed to look how noise annoyance has changed in people from uh, previous years to now. So these are the results. Um, as you can see, these um, just basically show that since 1992, there has been a substantial increase, almost five tenfold, um, from people saying that they were annoyed at each um, day-night noise level um, from then to now. So why do we see such a great increase? Why are more people saying that they are annoyed by the aircraft noise levels? One is being that a lot of people are moving from coastal and rural areas to cities for jobs and um, more opportunities. Another is lifestyle. As we know with the pandemic, a lot of people are teleworking, which means that they are working from their offices and home. Um, and a lot of people are spending more time outdoors, exercising, enjoying nature. So they're more apt to hearing that noise. And then there's the increased social media use. Um, social media is a great way to spread the word and get people's awareness up about the issue. And so increasing social media use has been able to uh, make more people aware of the issue. And a combination of all these factors has actually had societal society actually create a response to this issue that exists. So here you'll see a noise exposure map. This is specific to the Hartsville Jackson International Airport. And these outlines that you see um, around the airport are actually noise contours. Um, noise contours are basically regions around the airport where a certain decibel or level of noise is said to be found. And so that's usually um, 65, 70, and 75 decibels. And anything above 65 decibels is not suitable for schools or for homes. Alrighty, so the noise insulation program, um, there's actually eligibility. Um, this program was started by the Hartsville Jackson International Airport. And basically to be eligible for this program, you have to be located within that 65 contour level that was shown on the map. You must have one of the eligible property types. Um, you must have participated previously, um, and you must have con a building constructed before April 10th of 1985. And so those are things that you have to have in order to um, get insulation into um, your home or business. Um, and just to clarify the insulation, you must have pr participated previously um, to Yes, you must have participated previously in order to have participated or get the installation the second time. Alrighty, so the FAA webinar was on February the 22nd. This was a um, showcase of what the FAA has done as far as their research when it comes to aircraft noise. It was a two hour presentation and I was fortunate enough to submit my comments after attending this webinar. And so my request for comments was on the behalf of the College of Public Health and this fellowship. Um, and so on the next slide will be a little document showing my comments that I was able to present. Um, these comments just basically tell my own research and what I think um, is really impacting the city of College Park specifically, um, not speaking for other cities around other airports across the nation, um, but what has really impacted the citizens of College Park um, because of the aircraft and the flight paths. I was fortunate enough to sit down with Mayor Bianca Motley Broom um, to talk about how she thinks that noise has impacted the city. So first, Thinking about how uh, noise can be reduced, she thinks that funding is definitely something um, that 
the city needs in order to reduce noise, um, funding for continuing the aircraft technology, and making airplanes quieter. We want to make new structures um, that are built to mitigate noise. And as far as um, suggestions, education is super important. So they want to uh, educate citizens that live in the city on noise pollution and what that means to their health, what it means to the city, um, and what they're trying to do to mitigate that. Also, uh, making sure that people aren't interrupted with their daily activities due to the noise and um, just trying to keep the peace around the issue that is noise pollution for the city. Also had a sit down with Councilman Clay. He has done a ton of research on aircraft noise and noise pollution um, as far as next gen and clean technologies. This is all about making airplanes fly higher and fly um, higher sooner. And so making sure flight paths are not over um, a lot of residences and areas where it's really gonna impact people living in their homes. Um, he pointed out that cities, areas in the city with the most noise includes Camp Creek Parkway, Ward 2 and Ward 4. Um, also apartment buildings with multiple levels. He is actually a part of two national organizations, the Aviation Rulemaking Committee and the Airport Improvement Program. Um, and so he has done a ton of research. I was really happy that I was able to sit down with him and gain so much new knowledge. Alrighty, so he also feels like the national noise um, standard needs to be changed. Um, people need to fly higher sooner, as I mentioned. And then we can lobby Congress for a new round of insulation um, to help mitigate that noise. All right, so just health disparities, we want to keep in mind that um, the city of College Park is a very cultural city. Um, black and brown communities make up the majority of the city. Um, there are some people that have lower socioeconomic status. And so combining that all with the airport environmental pollution can be a big issue. And so we want to make sure that we can um, create a way to give the beautiful city back to um, its citizens and so they can go out and enjoy everything that the city has to offer. So that leads to my next steps. Um, I really want to encourage the FAA to collaborate with the airport to conduct a needs assessment. Um, the needs assessment can be in any form from focus groups surveys to interviews, um, also putting together a team of health educators to go into the community to um, actually do the education for the citizens to let them know what noise pollution is and how it affects them. And then from there, we can evaluate our next steps. So hopefully this will be the next students that come after me that can do that. Our acknowledgements. Um, Dr. Christina Proctor, she is my mentor. Uh, she was amazing. Mr. Gary Young, the Director of Airport Affairs, was amazing helping me and meeting with me and being super flexible with our Zoom meetings. Um, Ms. Mayor Bianca Motley Broom was awesome to sit down and talk to and being so open and candid with me. Also, Councilman Ambrose Clay, who was so um, open and willing to share his research with me. And lastly, Dean Marsha Davis um, and the rest of the Health Equity fellow um, staff. I really appreciate you guys and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, thank you guys so much. Any questions? I don't have any questions. This is uh, Gary Young with the City of College Park, Director of Airport Affairs. Are you able to uh, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I just want to say to Amber, uh, congratulations on uh, a phenomenal um, amount of work. The FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, released its Neighborhood Environmental Survey just as we were starting on this pro program, on this uh, discussion with Amber. And uh, that, that document was about 450 some pages of Federal Aviation Administration analysis and policy. And uh, Amber did a phenomenal job of sticking through, uh, reading through all of that, 
and then offering comment and, and, and many questions to the city of College Park. And we truly appreciate her and all the faculty at UGA for, for creating this, uh, this, this, this dialogue. We want to thank you for partnering with us. Thank you so much. And Amber, Amber did her initial presentation for me last week, and I said we've got to we've got to get some terms in here. Amber, you have become an aviation expert. I have never heard any of these terms. I know nothing about this. <laughs> so she had, so we went through she went through a process of educating me, and then in turn we put some definitions in here because um, her expertise was shining through. And I said we we've got to. Get <laughs> We've got to get some of these terms defined in here. So uh, I can speak to Amber's expertise that she has gained. <laughs> and she did a great job in understanding the, the various perspectives. So you have the airlines with the perspective, uh, the developers of the airplanes, and then you have uh, the perspective of the airports, each of those with powerful lobbying groups in Washington, and, uh, and then the local, the, jur the jurisdictions that are around airports. And uh, Amber was very uh, sensitive and ab ab able to uh, understand the various points of view that, that create a dialogue that can be very rich uh, uh, related to this topic. So congratulations, Amber. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all of your um, hard work in working with me. I really do um, hope that we can continue these efforts and thank you so much. Thank you, Amber. All right, we're going to move into our last presentation now. We have got Kenya Murray. Just a, a quick note for you all. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is get a diverse cohort of students this first round in terms of where, what programs they were coming from. And so of the five students you've seen today, we've had two master's students, two undergraduate students, and one doctoral student. And Kenya is our one um, doctoral student. So she is last but certainly not least, and I'm looking forward to um, to you, Kenya, sharing your work. And would you like for me to actually enable screen sharing for you? Um, could you allow me to share? I do have some figures that I point to throughout the yes. presentation. I'm making you co-host right now. Okay, excellent. All right, that's good. You're good to go. Alrighty. And can everyone hear me okay? We okay. can. Okay, let's share my screen. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenya Murray. I am a first year doctoral student within the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And my partner city is Fitzgerald, Georgia. And so today I'll be presenting on um, exploring community and provider perspectives on barriers to the adoption of a free medical clinic model in Fitzgerald, Georgia. And we consider this to be a path to equitable access to preventive care. Uh, a quick overview of my talk, I'll first define health equity for you and then describe life in Fitzgerald, Georgia, We'll review some demographic information about Fitzgerald. Um, I'll describe a quick research project and we'll discuss next steps. And so Paula Braveman and others out of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation define health equity as follows. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And to achieve this, we must remove obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and deep power imbalances and their consequences, including lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and healthcare. And also before we move forward, I'd like to distinguish the differences between the social determinants of health and also the social determinants of equity. And so within our line of work, we often see these used together. We often see them just listed as the social determinants of health. However, I'd like to offer that these are two separate systems that are underlying the differences that we see in health status between and within community. And so on the left here, I presented a model, and this is the model offered by the World Health Organization for how to conceptualize social determinants of health. And so they define the social determinants of health as the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. And so they include economic stability, healthcare systems, community and social context, food, education, neighborhood and physical environment. 
And so these are the conditions in which we are born, live, grow, work, play, and age. And research has shown that these factors contribute to at least 80% of health outcomes that are experienced by people. And so on the right side here, I presented the social determinants of equity. And so these represent the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life that often prevent marginalized communities from experiencing healthy lives. And so I call these our isms. Um, this list could be really exhausted, but I've, I've just listed a few here. And so this includes racism, sexism, ageism, classism, heterosexism, and ableism, just to name a few. And so we have a unique job as public health professionals. We must be addressing both of these. And so addressing the social determinants of health will allow us to improve health outcomes for different populations, while simultaneously addressing the social determinants of equity will allow us to achieve social justice and eliminate health disparities. And so now we're gonna go on a quick tour. We're gonna go on a tour to what life is like in Fitzgerald. And so Fitzgerald is located in the South Central region of Georgia, and this is about three hours South of Atlanta. And it's the only incorporated city in Ben Hill County. Um, the mayor of Fitzgerald is Jim Puckett, and he has been in office since 2017. Um, I can say that I have not had the privilege of visiting Fitzgerald um, due to social distancing restrictions. Um, however, I've I've learned a lot over this past semester about what daily life is like in Fitzgerald um, from listening to our county partners um, or our community partners, Christine Graham and Cam Jordan. Um, they've shared a lot of their lived experience of what the day-to-day -day life is like in Fitzgerald. And I've really just gotten a sense that it's a rich community, rich in social cohesion and social capital. And so they have a huge growing slate of community events that you could just really see the civic engagement and community connectedness shining through. Um, I've listed three of them here that look really interesting. I would love to attend them. Um, the first one would be the annual Wild Burmese Chicken Festival. And so these Burmese chickens are rent free. They don't pay rent in Fitzgerald. They just walk around and people own them. And so there's a wild chicken festival that happens every year in Fitzgerald. Gerald. Um, they also do a lot of work around diversity and unity with the Harmony Jubilee Festival and also um, a homecoming festival that's specific for their African American populations. Um, so they have quite a few events to attend and you could just see the, the social capital and the strength of the community shining through. And so I'd also like to present a demographic profile comparison comparing Fitzgerald with Ben Hill County, which is the county that it sits within, with the entire state of Georgia. And so Fitzgerald has about 8,662 residents that make a median household income of a little over $24,000 per year. And so as you can see, this is significantly less than what the earnings are for residents of the rest of the county and also in comparison with the entire state of Georgia um, population makes. Fitzgerald suffers from a high rate of poverty compared to Ben Hill County and also Georgia with 36% of individuals representing those in poverty. Also very alarming are the high rates of poverty amongst children. We see here that 54% of their children live in impoverished conditions. In terms of race and ethnicity, 57% um, of their population identifies black, 39% white and 1% Hispanic. And so now I wanted to take time to just share another side of what the lived experience is like in Fitzgerald. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what I've learned about Fitzgerald since I haven't physically visited there um, has rested upon the stories that have been shared with me by Christine and Cam. And so they share with me just different aspects of what the day-to-day -day lived experience is like. And I've just kind of combined that into a fictitious story that I will share with you. And so meet Jenny. And so Jenny is a 45-year-old mother mother of three, and she's lived in Fitzgerald all of her life. And as you can see here in this image, Jenny is stressed out because she has all of the social determinants of health that are pressing down on her life that will potentially lead her to a negative health outcome. You see, Jenny has diabetes. And also two years ago, Jenny suffered from a stroke. While being affected by these chronic illnesses, Jenny still goes to work every day and works a full-time job to support a family. And she earns about $23,000 a year, which is below the federal poverty level for her family unit. However, Jenny still goes to work and she earns the living. Um, Jenny does not have health insurance. She does not qualify for Medicaid. Um, she actually falls within this coverage group that makes too much money to qualify for Medicaid. Um, however, she still you know, lives below the federal poverty level. All of this is a result of Georgia not 
um, expanding their Medicaid um, to other low income communities. And so Jenny uh, typically depends upon her emergency department for her day to day care and all of her health care visits um, because she cannot afford health insurance from any other means. Um, she often has to make a decision between whether she wants to pay her bills or whether she will decide to go and receive some sort of preventative care. So on a recent visit to the emergency department, Jenny was told that she needs to see a medical specialist for the maintenance of her chronic illness. However, to go back. However, the nearest medical specialist is over an hour and a half away in Macon, Georgia. And this is approximately 106 miles away from Jenny's home in Fitzgerald. Jenny also thought about leaning on her community for support. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, her community is already in a vulnerable status and she does not have the social support needed um, to get her to the medical specialist. And so this is just one scenario of the other side of what it's like to live in Fitzgerald. And so Jenny has all of these social determinants of health in terms of she has a chronic illness. She makes very little money, lives below the federal poverty level. She's not covered by insurance. She lives in a medical desert. And also her community is already in a vulnerable status. However, they're being impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so these are the social determinants of health that we wanted to direct uh, my fellowship efforts toward. And so in starting this fellowship, I did think to myself how we were going to accomplish a health equity project within such a short amount of time. Um, so I thought it would be appropriate to kind of just map out what we did with our time. So in February of week one, we had our initial introductory meeting with the partners. Um, I met with the city officials of Fitzgerald, that's Cam and Christine, and we just kind of got to know each other. During week two, we got on the ground running, um, we identified what data sources were available um, that were current that could really help us to identify where the health inequities lie. So we identified three data sources. The first one was a family needs assessment that was conducted in 2018. The second one was a community health needs assessment that was conducted by the local hospital. And the third one was a Salvation Army emergency assistance survey that was conducted in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So week three, I took these data sources and just reviewed them and also conducted a secondary data analysis to see if I could pull out any common themes. Week four in March, we selected what health equity area of focus we would um, center our efforts on. And we utilized week five and six to de develop um, a research proposal, which I'll talk a little bit about later. So for our data analysis, again, we had three data sources, but I'll only mention one here. Um, this is our community health needs assessment survey that was conducted for Ben Hill County by the local um, hospital. And so there were 33 respondents for this survey and two key questions I pulled out that I want to reference. The first question was, what are the top major or the most pressing healthcare needs of the community? So respondents were asked that. And the second one was, what are the barriers that you're experiencing as it relates to care? Respondents identified primary and preventative care as the top health need or area of concern, followed by obesity and nutrition assistance, and then lastly, followed by chronic disease education as their major healthcare needs within their community. In terms of perceived barriers, cost, insurance coverage, and education ranked very high as um, potential barriers to care. So based on our secondary data analysis, and also just the mere fact that residents generally have to travel long distances to sometimes receive care, we select a preventative care access as our health equity area of focus. And so our partners were specifically interested in what types of barriers or if it was even feasible to bring a free medical clinic model to the community of Fitzgerald. And so to add a little bit more context to that, and so from my understanding, from listening to the stories from um, Mr. Cam Jordan, um, several decades ago, um, Fitzgerald benefited from having a free dental clinic in their community. Um, there was a local dentist that out of the goodness of his heart, um, decided to start offering free dental preventative services services to low income residents. Um, however, that dentist retired and that clinic retired with him. So there was no one to kind of take on and formalize the structure um, to bring preventative care within um, this particular neighborhood. So we decided to utilize our point in time health equity project um, and transition it to an entire health equity research study, a qualitative study to be exact. And so when thinking about this whole narrative of rural health and what are the experience of um, rural health residents 
acceptance. Um, from my own experience, I could say that it's often treated as a monolith. Um, however, in, as a result of it, tre it's treated as a monolith, those who suffer the most are the ones that are not really a part of the rural health disparities conversation that's going on across America. And so for us, we know the numbers, we know the quantitative experience of residents who live in Fitzgerald. We know that there's a high number of folks who don't have health insurance. We know that there's a high burden of particular, you know, chronic diseases. Um, but what we don't know is what's the lived experience of residents behind the quantitative metric and that's what we really want to get at with our quanti uh, qualitative study. And so um, I can say that we have successfully um, written our research proposal up and submitted it to the University of Georgia's Institutional Review Board. So our research study is currently under review. Um, however, I'll share some um, quick facts uh, or some details about our study. And so in terms of our research question, our research question is, what are the barriers and facilitators to the adoption of a free medical clinic model in Fitzgerald, Georgia? And we're really looking at the provider and community perspectives. And so we have two aims. The first aim is to conduct and analyze qualitative in-depth interviews to understand perceived barriers that influence community members' engagements with preventative care. Our second aim is to determine the feasibility of adopting a free medical clinic within Fitzgerald from a health provider's perspective. So here I have just kind of presented a layout of what our study flow will look like. We're taking a qualitative approach here with our data collection and also our data analysis. And so we're gonna conduct semi-structured in-depth interviews with residents and healthcare providers um, in the city of Fitzgerald to really understand what are the barriers to healthcare access and needs. In terms of the questions that we're gonna ask, thinking back to those social determinants of health and also social determinants of equity, we're asking questions around structural and interpersonal barriers. Um, much of our work that we're gonna engage in here is encapsulated in this model known as the public health critical race praxis. And so this is a model that's often used by public health professionals to help us really untangle the root causes of health disparities. And so we're gonna use this framework to devise questions centered around transportation, racism, other aspects that influence healthcare aspects and ask those questions to our um, residents of Fitzgerald. And so in terms of recruiting, um, we're specifically recruiting and centering our efforts on the margins. We're recruiting from organizations that service low-income families. And so we've identified three organizations that we're gonna recruit our community member participants from. One is a monitor enrichment program, which is an after-school program for children. Um, the second one is a Head Start program and also the Division of Family and Children's Services. And so we're hoping that um, we could utilize our partnerships that our city partners already has with these organizations to get community members and also providers um, to participate in our study. And so what specific community members are we interviewing? So we're interviewing those who are 18 years of age or older, who have been a resident of Fitzgerald for at least two years, and those who have access to some sort of computer or a phone that can be interviewed. Um, so given restrictions for COVID-19, we're not able to come and do the interviews in person. So a lot of our activities, um, most of them will occur via Zoom. In terms of healthcare providers, we've already started developing our list of um, health care providers um, that represent different areas of specialty um, within um, the community. So we're going to recruit them by email and phone and to ask them to participate in our studies. So of course, we're interviewing providers that are over the age of 18 um, that have been practicing as a physician or a physician assistant, a nurse care um, practitioner, or even a, a nurse. Um, and we are specifically looking for those who are currently working at a healthcare facility within Fitzgerald. Um, but we've also expand our criteria, expanded our criteria to include the surrounding counties, just recognizing that some healthcare providers work at multiple locations. Um, so we're also going to interview those who are in Turner and Irwin counties um, as well. And so from there, after our data collection process, we're going to go through an iterative process of reading these stories and these lived experiences that are provided to us by community residents and develop some sort of coding and theme and go through the entire qualitative data analysis process. So now what? Um, so 
public health requires effective knowledge translation in order to turn research into action. And so one of our main goals is to facilitate this research study, but to also promote education so that we can inform policy about health and healthcare specific to Fitzgerald residents. And so a lot of this is realized through research synthesis, but also through the dissemination of research findings. A lot of times the precursor to a health intervention actually making it into a community is the research study that brought the issue to light. So our hope is that we, with our research study, we're going to develop a report about my experience as a health equity fellow working with um, these local partners within the community, but also from our data collection efforts, we're going to analyze our data and publish our findings in a scientific review journal. And so um, in terms of next steps, we're going to continue our collaboration after this fellowship. And so um, Christine and Cam have graciously agreed to continue these efforts with me, and we will begin our research study data collection efforts over the summer. Um, so looking forward to that. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted, you know, to take a moment to thank the city um, stakeholders of Fitzgerald, Christine Graham and Cam Jordan um, have been fantastic um, to work with. Um, they have given me their every Friday um, to share stories with me, but to also work on this project to ensure that we produce a product that can really change the lives of residents in Fitzgerald. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Juliet Sikandi, who is masterful at methodology and research, and um, she was my assigned mentor. And also, I'd like to thank these um, fellowship coordinators for their support and guidance throughout this process, and also the fellowship funders. Thank you. Kenya, thank you so much. All right, that wraps our last presentation. Kenya, do you, uh, does anyone have questions for Kenya or comments? I have a, a question if I could, I'm Mel Garber. I was curious if, if, there, if you found an other community, a comparable community in the state of Georgia that had implemented a free healthcare plan. I can say from, um, I'm not too keen on it. Um, I can say Pierre counties, um, there was one in Decatur, Georgia, but I, I'm not too, too keen upon it. Um, okay. I do know of successful, I'm also from a rural community that's nearly identical to Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. it's in the state of Mississippi. And so Mississippi has been sort of like the pilot model for free medical clinics. And so I am familiar with clinics there, yeah. but not peer counties that have adopted a medical free medical clinic model yeah. that are similar to Fitzgerald. Yeah. Grace, if I could add to answer Mel's question, um, the county school system here in Milledgeville, actually the Baldwin County school system, they have opened up a medical clinic through their school system. And for those people that are uninsured, it is a free clinic. Um, so, and, and they don't only just see students, they see parents, caregivers, parents, yeah. those, those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, if, if, you, if, um, if you would put your contact information in the chat, I might be able to get the, the school superintendent to share some information with you about how they set that up in the school system here in Milledgeville. Thank you so much, Hank, for, for, for that. And um, Mel, to your question as well, Hank, you just kind of made me think of something that Clark County has also done the same thing in Clark County School District. Right. And there's a lot of community school models um, that are where you, you have that happening, where they have free clinics yeah. for the uninsured yeah. that are opening attached to the school. And I think in general, we're going to continue, especially in rural communities, to see those communities get really flexible and creative. Yeah. Um, as, especially as we see just more and more strains on the healthcare system and accessing affordable care, because as we've had other presenters today highlight, it's just not sustainable to have so many of our um, community members just relying on the emergency room for care. Um, it's just not at all a sustainable model. So um, it's going to be interesting. I think this kind of research is going to be really important. I would just say it for Kenya. I think my experience over a number of years is even if it's not a a real comparable comparison that's okay to to listen to learn and then you you can synthesize across you know to who you know who you're working with and especially when you look at the data and you know along that line dr pippin at uh piedmont athens regional i think was the one that helped get that pre-clinic going in athens that would be something local that 
probably could learn from and somehow might inform the study you're doing. I, I just mentioned that as sort of input to, you know, broad base look as you, as you zero in on Fitzgerald, which is a great community. I had a chance to spend a lot of time there over time and some great folks there. Thank you, Dr. Garber. Any other questions or thoughts for Kenya? I just want to make sure that um, we thank Kenya for her hard work here in our community. Um, we're really excited about the information um, and the feedback that we'll get from the study that we're doing. Um, whether it results in a free clinic or results in us having something to carry to the school to, to develop and grow what they do there. Um, you know, we're, we're really happy to have it. Um, and, you know, the more information we have about you know, we think we know what people's experience is, but actually finding out what those experiences is are so valuable. And we think it um, will give us lots of new directions to go to improve the community. So thank you, Kenya. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Graham. Thank you for trusting us to partner with you. And I, I really look forward to seeing where Kenya's work goes. Kenya, I, I know you're a first year doc student, but this is enough for a dissertation. So <laughs> as you transition to the summer, we'll be working on this research together and it's gonna be really interesting and wonderful, I think, and to see where, where this can go. Um, well, that really concludes our presentations for today. I have Becky Taylor, who's gonna say a few words from GMA and then I'll close us out, Becky. Grace, thank you so much for the opportunity just to say a few words on behalf of GMA. Um, I know we have a number of staff here represented and um, we all just wanna thank you so much for bringing this opportunity to our cities and to GMA for bringing this wonderful partnership to us and making this pilot program available to these five cities. Um, this is not expertise that our cities have had um, access to in the past. So it's a unique opportunity and I'm so thrilled that we're going to be able to continue this and look forward to conversations about how we can continue the partnership. Um, I want to thank the mayors and the city leaders who took the time and the leap of faith to work on this. I can tell you we knew from the beginning with our experience in working with Grace and with the university that y'all were going to be in great hands and uh, obviously um, I'm blown away and I'm sure everybody else who listened today is as well. So I'm, I'm so um, happy to see the great results, but not at all surprised. Um, these fellows have done a phenomenal job. Uh, thank you very much to the, the faculty who worked in partnership um, with us on this. Um, certainly uh, to Dean Davis for our, your leadership throughout and to all the fellows for the great amazing work that you've done. I, I'm just so um, overwhelmed. I have so many thoughts going because a lot, you know, as, as you all know from our initial meeting and kickoff meeting, um, this, um, these efforts all dovetail very nicely and actually perfectly with a lot of the initiatives that GMA is working on with our Equity Inclusion Commission, with our uh, Georgia City Solution 501c3, with the COVID vaccine initiative, and so many other things that we're working on right now. None of us could have known, and I'm, I'm sure you students didn't know when you got into this path that you would be headed into this program and the pandemic would hit, but we have all learned so much about the needs for public health equity over the last year. Um, if, we, if we didn't know about it before, those needs have been certainly highlighted um, over the last year, and I'm just grateful um, as a GMA uh, staffer who serves cities in Georgia as a mom and a, you know, a daughter and a human being alive during this time to see the um, amazing talent that we have here um, and the future of our public health um, equity programs around the state. I'm just so thankful. Congratulations to you all, to all of the fellows and thank you again. And um, just think if anybody else on the GMA staff would like to um, chime in, please, um, feel free to say something because I know all of you have worked, everybody on this call from GMA has worked in partnership through this program to help provide some guidance and leadership. So if you have any remarks, um, please let me know. All right, thank you so much, Becky. And I wanna say thank you to Holger Lewendorf and Brian Wallace on this call too. Y'all were part of the initial conversation that we had. And again, just your trust and faith in us is, is really invaluable. I want to 
share just a little story with our students and with everybody on this call to show you how small the world is and how you never know how an opportunity that might plant a seed for later. Kay Love is on this call. When I was a student in graduate school, Kay, hey there, good to see you. It's been almost 15 years. Um, I'm telling both of our age, I guess. By We're, saying not <laughs> We're not counting. We're not counting. We're not counting yet. But when I was a master's student, um, I was paired with GMA and the local government practicum with Roswell, Georgia, and um, a beautiful city and got the privilege and honor of working with Roswell and, and Kay, I want you to know that was with the seed for local government um, was really planted with me and it was not lost on me. And so here we are all these years later, <laughs> but um, you never know how these opportunities will influence you. And, and I think pave the way for more opportunities later. So I'm eternally grateful to GMA um, and also to Dean Marsha Davis for giving us the opportunity as a college to go in this direction. I think that where we are at our best is where we find opportunities um, where our, our shared mission, vision, values, as I said in the beginning, overlap and where we work together to really make progress together. Um, as Becky has said, you know, COVID really in some sense didn't create new inequity. I think it pulled the curtain back on the inequity, the deep inequity that already existed and the disparity that has to be addressed. And um, as we talk together and, and get better at prioritizing conversations about racial and social justice, I think it's going to be um, just critical that we hold hands and walk alongside one another as we develop those skill sets and as we really dig deep to address some of these issues that have faced us for so long. And so I just want to thank each student for being brave and each city for trusting us again. Um, we appreciate you and your time. We've finished up a few minutes early. If you're on this call and you're a city with GMA uh, and you want to partner with us in the future, you know how to find us. You know how to find Becky or uh, Holger or Brian. Um, and yeah, so just, just thank you so much to everyone. Take good care and we will be continuing with this program in the fall. And we look forward again to pursuing understanding and taking action as a college of public health in partnership with you all. So Thank you so much and take care.